Okay. So you, you, you're there, you're starting to take your courses, you, you kind of hook up with, with like the right. No, yeah, but so, so when you got to get hooked up with the group, right? So you obviously are a white guy, so you might hook up with, with those guys. Are there like subgroups, you know, like for example, like are AB, like is it like AB here and just regular white? Like how, how does that, because I'm fascinated by like it's racially segregated, right? But there's also a lot of different ideologies. Are you kind of forced to roll with somebody you may not have the right ideology with? Or is there like subsects that you can maybe like, okay, you know what? I'll roll with these guys, but not these. You know what I mean? Okay. So I'll tell you this, right? When you come to Big Sandy, I get there. There's a guy there. He was also involved in the mob, Adam Oliveri. Okay. I don't know if you know who Adam is. He was with, uh -huh. um, I forgot exactly. I could pull it up, but I forgot exactly who he was with. One of the most, probably the toughest, most dangerous white dude in the whole prison over there. All right. Oh, wow. But as soon as you come there and you're from the East Coast, you don't really have a choice. They tell you, hey, if you don't want to be a part of the car, you don't have to be. Yeah. But they're going to smash you. And what I mean by smash you is you're going to get you're going to get throttled and you're not going to be there no more. You're going to yeah. get beat up. They probably won't stab you for, for that, but they will yeah. definitely beat you up. Back then, you're not you're going to be in your car. And if you're not, they kind of feel like, you know, you're turning your back on people. They're Stevie Burke from Boston. Oh, right? wow. So Stevie Burke is the shot caller. Adam Oliveri is like the second in command. But he is the muscle. Adam is the muscle. And, you know, the next day they're like, yo, your homeboys want to see you, man. They're there. They already know I'm coming. They know my number. They lay down the rules. This is what it is. And, and whether or not you have the same ideology of, as them or not, you're going to be in that car. And that's just what it was, man. Now, now that obviously this comes with the price. Is it you got to like kind of do certain things? You got to give up commissary? Like what, what's kind of the this guy, they're not doing this out of the kindness of their heart. You know, what's generally the kick on these type of things? Well, it's not that they're not doing it out of the kindness of their heart, but what they, you know, there's power in numbers, right? Sure. So the more people you have, the more power you have. And Stevie Burke was on a power trip over there. Like, just, it just got, it got crazy because Adam ends up stamping the cop. We all end up getting transferred. Things happen over there. But no, it's not that they take your commissary. They don't do no shit like that. They're like, yo, look, you're a homeboy and this is what it is. And if you turn your back on us, then we know, you know, you don't feel the same way we do. So we're going to smash you. Oh, there isn't a, you know, a different sex over here, different sex over there. But what it is, is like, let's say you're from the South and you're white and you're from Florida. You're in the Florida white South car, right? Yeah. Or let's say you're from North Carolina. You may very well be in the North Carolina car or Texas. Wherever you're from, that's where you're going to be. But the East Coast guys, we stuck together. And Stevie Burke, you know, some of the guys listening probably know who he is. He was on a power trip, man. He wanted to be the boss. And I talk about this in my book where he's the type of guy who had nothing left in life. You know, life was forever gone for Stevie Burke. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to be the shot caller. He wanted to have the keys for the whole yard. He wanted to control all the white dudes. Um, and at the time, there was an Aryan Brotherhood gang member over there named Bam. He was kind of like the big homie, the guy that people were like, he's got the yard. And Stevie Burke's like, he don't have the yard. He don't tell us what to do. We're from the East Coast. And he didn't tell us what to do. You know, we had the numbers. We had 100 dudes in our car, 120 dudes. And, so you know, so I'm a big believer in um, whenever there's any type of, you know, ecosystem and jails an ecosystem, it could be a community, it could be anything. The cream always rises to the top, right? So you started studying the law and you started making yourself, I didn't read your book yet and I'm looking forward to getting the copy, but I, what I gathered from my re, my quick research on it, because I don't like to research too much because I want it to be organic, but, but what I got from you, you kind of separated yourself as like the jailhouse lawyer in a way where you were like, helping people they needed you you didn't discriminate you know like you were valuable you know did that kind of happen where you started helping yourself out and was that your strategy like oh shit you know what let me be the brains let me help people out or did you just start like doing this and organically you became the jailhouse guy because i thought that was interesting and i felt like you were helping yourself out but it was also seemed like a good survival strategy as well so in Big Sandy, I, you know, I was going to the law library. I was just doing my own thing for me, but I was yeah. learning the law and, and, you know, it was a gift. I guess God gave me a gift because, yeah. you know, I was able to be successful. I got over a hundred people out of prison while in prison and out. I own a paralegal and prison consultant firm now. But what happened was I eventually get transferred. I go to Coleman, right? And I'm always in the law library. I'm always doing legal work. And there's this kid from Tennessee and we get locked down. He sends me up his paperwork. Look, man, I really need your help. We're locked down. I can't write the stuff for the government's reply. Could you write this for me, man? I'll hook you up, man. What will you charge me? And I write him back. I said, look, man, you know, I really never done other people's cases. Yeah. It was a, it was a bull crap, crack, bull crap, uh, crack case. Yeah. And I was like, look, man, I don't really want to do it. I don't trust my, he's like, man, please. I need you. So I do it. Long story short, I do it. And we win. 
and I charge them thirty dollars. I said, "Get me a couple of deodorants and some chips and a case of soda." I don't know. Well, I win that. Now this this is a black kid from Tennessee. We we end up winning. He gets some time knocked off. He's got like a year or two left. He starts telling everybody after the lockdown, "Hey, this guy won my case." People are coming to me, and I'm like, and one of the first the first real case that I did was a twenty two fifty five post conviction motion for a guy that was carjacking people down in um, Florida. And I did that, and I won his case. And then after that, it was off to the races, man. I started doing big, big cases, and I started winning, man. And when you win, people want you to help them. And the culture in Coleman was all the dudes that were